This is the review quiz for chapter P.1. For this first question, we have evaluate the algebraic expression um, for this, this expression right here. And then we're just plugging in x equal to 5. So I'm, all I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this expression. So we have 3 plus 4 times the quantity x minus 3. x is 5. So let's plug in 5 into x minus 3 and cube it. So for, for uh, order of operations, we use PEMDAS. And the first thing we have is parentheses. So inside the parentheses is the first operation we're going to do. Then we follow PEMDAS again. Um, there's no exponents in here, so that's done. There's no multiplication in here, so that's done. Addition and subtraction, there is that. So five minus three, that's the first thing I'm going to do here according to order of operations. Five minus three is two. And now this is the new expression. Now this parentheses just has a number on the inside of it, so we can uh, call it complete. Now we move on to exponents. Two cubed is the first thing we do. Two cubed is eight. Of course, four times two cubed. There's no more exponents, so that's done. Multiplication and division. Four times eight is the first thing I'm going to do then. Four times eight is 32. Multiplication and division are done. The last thing is addition and subtraction. 3 plus 32 is 35. Let's check that. And that's correct. Okay, the next one we are doing an intersection of the following sets. An intersection is asking what is in common in both of these things. We have T x b intersected with b x and t so we're asking what's the set with uh everything that's in common so t is in both of them so t will be there x is in both of them so x will be in the intersection and b is also in the both of them so b will be in the intersection and in fact these are both the same set uh order doesn't matter in sets so Really, these are the same set. So if you intersect a set with itself, you get backed, back itself. There's, there's no difference. So we're going to have T, X, and B. And that's correct. Okay, now we're looking at union. So intersection was asking what's in common in both. Union is pretty much as much as possible. So um, everything that you can have in the answer so we have these four elements in the first set and then 5 14 and 15 in the second so the union i'm going to start with the first set is going to have 2 5 13 and 14 and in the second set we already have a 5 there's no repetition allowed in sets so the 5 is not going to be added in, as a um, an additional 5 the 14 is also not going to be added again. The 15, however, we do not have yet, so I'm going to add that. And that's the union. It's everything possible that's unique. Make sure sets never have repetition. So we have 2, 5, 13, 14, and 15. And that's correct. Okay, here we have... Uh, a, a, a listing and we're asking what is the um, set of, of real numbers that each one of these things falls in. So what's important to note is the different different categories. The, the first one, A, is the natural numbers. The natural numbers are all of the counting numbers. So zero, um, not zero, it starts with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, all the way on up to positive infinity. The whole numbers is the exact same set, but now we add zero. It's everything the natural numbers have and zero included in it. Integers, this, oops, integers is with a Z. This is all of these numbers that are in the whole numbers and the negatives of them. So we're gonna start with negative infinity all the way on up to negative 3, negative 2, 
negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And then all the way on up to positive infinity. So negative 1 million is in there. Um, 100 billion is in there. All of these numbers are in there. They are not decimal numbers, though. And that those start showing up in the rationals. That's what the D is, rational numbers. These I cannot list out like, well, I could list it out, but it's not going to be very coherent. And instead, I'm going to list it like this. Uh, the rational numbers are all numbers that, that, are in the, that can be written in the form A over B such that A and B are elements of the integers. So A and B are just one of these integer numbers. So negative 2 and, and 1 is going to be in there. Uh, 2 over negative 1 will be in there. Those, those are the types of numbers there. So let me just write that out. Negative 3 over uh, 2. Three, uh, let's do like one over negative two. Of course, it also fits any number in here, so we could do like uh, negative one hundred or uh, negative eleven thousand seven hundred and thirty-eight over um one million. That's also a rational number because it's an integer over an integer. That's that's what these types are now. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that these are all the numbers that have a infinitely, infinitely repeating decimal or a terminating decimal. I mean, I mean, it just stops. You can also think of a terminating decimal as one that at some point has an infinitely repeating zero, so it's going to be like 1.5 is the same thing as 1.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way on up to infinity. Um, so these are really the same thing, but um, that's, a, that's a great way of thinking about it if you have a decimal number. Um, normally, we write rationals as their integer um, fractions, but either one is correct. Then we have the irrational numbers. That's the next one. Those are going to be um, all the real numbers that are not rational. So these are going to be, I can't write it in a set. I can, however, say um, infinite decimals, let's see, um, infinite decimals that are non-repeating. So this cannot have any, any infinite repetition. So uh, an infinite repeating decimal would be something like 3.4, uh, 3.4343443, and just continues that 434343 on indefinitely. And infinitely non-repeating would be something that just randomly jumbles the 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 letters or the um, the numbers together. Um, things that do this are, are like pi. Pi does not have an infinitely repeating um, decimal representation. Um, also, any square root. Pretty much any square root of, of any number, except for perfect squares. So if we looked at the square root of of 25, this is not an irrational number because the square root of 25 is 5. It's a perfect square. So this is not irrational. However, the square root of 40, 40 is not a perfect square, and therefore it will be an irrational number. It will have a infinite decimal that not that, that does not repeat itself infinitely. So that's what irrationals are. Finally, real numbers. That's the last set here that we're going to be looking at. Real numbers is the R. This one's the simplest. It's just the rationals unioned with the irrationals. That's all it is um, for the real numbers. So really, the rationals and the irrationals Combine those, that's the whole number system that we're used to working with. And this problem is just asking us to sort these numbers into all of their parts. Because it should be clear that if we have a whole number, or let's say if we have a natural number, like 3, 3 is a natural number. It is also a whole number. It is also an integer. It's right there. And if we do 3 over 1, that's just going to be 3. It is also a uh, rational number. 
And all of these numbers will always be a real number. So a, a number can fit in multiple categories. Um, the big divide, however, happens with Q and I, uh, the rationals and the irrationals. Um, if it's a rational, it will not be an irrational and vice versa. So that's kind of the big divide there. However, all of these numbers are always going to be a real number. We're not working with complex numbers. So the first thing I can do is I can add these all to the real numbers. Let me uh, give me a little more space here to work with. Uh, 81, 0 is a real number. This is a real number. And square root of 5 is a real number. These are all real numbers. Okay, now we can subdivide them into their, their parts. So first off, let's look at ra uh, irrational numbers. These are all uh, infinitely long numbers that are non-repeating. So this is, not, this is not infinitely long. It stops. So this would be in, in a, um, a rational number. This is not infinitely long. It, it, once again, it's a terminating. It's 0 0.5. That's it. So it's a rational number. Pi is notoriously an, an irrational number. I actually show that here. The square root of 81, the square root of 81 is a perfect square. So it's going to be 9. 9 times 9 is 81. So this is a rational number. 0 is a rational number. It's actually uh, an integer. 0 over 1, 0 divided by 1. These are both integers over integers. Therefore, it's a rational number, and that gives you 0. So it's, an, it's a rational number. Negative 6 over 7, this is an integer over an integer, so that's going to be a rational number. And the square root of 5, 5 is not a perfect square, therefore it is irrational. You see, most of these numbers are rational, and only two of them are irrational. But in reality, there's a lot more irrational numbers. There's what's called uncountably infinite irrational numbers. Whereas rational numbers, these numbers we see a lot more because they're nicer to work with. That's just because they're nicer to work with. There's, there's, not, there's only countably infinite rational numbers. So it's kind of a weird thing to work with. These numbers are harder to work with in, in general. That's why we work with rational numbers normally. Okay, integers, these are, these are uh, easier because these do not have any decimals in them. So we know negative 5 is there. 0 0.5 is a decimal, so no. This is 3.1415. You know, there's a decimal there, so that's not going to be an integer. The square root of 81 is 9, so that's an integer. 0 is an integer. This is not an integer because it has a fraction. 6 over 7 is going to be something like, um, I'm not sure, point, point 0.8 something, I, I guess, 0.8333, something like that. And square root of 5 is definitely not a um, whole number. It's, a, it's a, got, got a decimal point in it. So now we can only, we, all we need to do is look at these three numbers to put into these two categories because the rest of them, um, these are, are, are only um, non-decimal numbers. So they're going to be whole numbers. So negative 5 is not a whole number. And it's not a natural number because negative 5 has a negative in it. And over here, negatives were first introduced with the integers, which we just sorted. So these numbers only have positives, and whole numbers only have 0. So 0 is going to go in a whole. It's not going to go in natural. And 9 will go in both because 9 is a positive whole number, and both of them have that. Hopefully this is all sorted correctly. Let's see. And it is. All right, here we're going to rewrite this expression without uh, absolute value bars. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Absolute value has a lot of good definitions but um, in a higher mathematics. But for this level of mathematics, really all we're trying to say is what's the distance from zero? And the distance from zero is always a positive number or a zero. And really, it's going to be the positive of the number itself. When there's just a number inside absolute values, really all you do is you take the positive of it. If it's positive, you just leave it positive. If it's negative, it stays the same, or it becomes positive. 
So the absolute value of negative 13, let me make these absolute value bars a little bit bigger here. We have the absolute value of negative 13 minus the absolute value of negative 7, and then we take the absolute value of this entire thing. So the absolute value of negative 13 asks what's the distance negative 13 is from 0, and it's 13 units from 0. I mean, that, that should make sense. If you draw a number line, negative 13 is 13 steps away from 0. It's always going to be a positive because distance is always 0 or positive. Negative 7 is 7 units away from 0. Now we can use order of operations. Inside first, 13 minus 7, that's going to be uh, 6. And what's the distance from 0 of 6? That's just 6. So this is really 6 units. That's, that's really the whole thing that we're asking there. That's correct. All right, simplify the given algebraic expression. 7 minus 9, and then the, we're, we're using brackets here just to clarify what we're talking about. They have the exact same meaning as parentheses, so don't get confused about that. So uh, to simplify, it's probably easiest to start on the inner, innermost set of parentheses. So I want to think of this negative as negative 1, and then distribute that. That way I can get rid of these parentheses, because I can't do anything here uh, between 5y and 5. These are not like terms. So I have to get rid of parentheses a different way. And you can do that by distributing. So we have 7 minus 9. Negative 1 times 5y is negative 5y. Negative 1 times negative 5 is positive 5. I can combine like terms here. We have 9 and positive 5. That gives me, I'm just going to combine it right to this spot right here, 9 plus 5 is 14. And once again I have parentheses, I can rewrite these brackets as parentheses if you want. It's the same thing. And to get rid of them, I can do that by distributing the negative 9. Make sure you distribute the negative 9, not just 9. The negative is on the 9. So we have 7. Negative 9 times 14 is negative 90 and negative 36. So it's going to be negative 126. Then we have negative 9 times negative 5. It's going to be positive 45. Y. The Y is still a part of that. We can combine like terms. 7 and negative 136 are like terms. That's going to give me uh, negative 119 plus 45y. And there's no more like terms there. So this should be our answer, as long as I didn't make an error. And that is correct. All right, last problem. We have a formula, and it's saying that we have, let me get some room again. We have a data here that, that's been collected for different uh, school years, and we have a model that's been um, inter extrapolated from this data. It's, it's been created um, by this data, and it's supposed to model this uh, real life behavior. So we have T is the uh, average cost of tuition, and X is the years, uh, is the school year ending X years after 2000. So 2008, 2007, it would be X equal to 7, because 2007 is 7 years after 2000. This would be X equal to 8, X equal to 9, X equal to 10. That's just an important thing to note. The first part says, use the formula to find the average cost of tuition and fees for the school year ending in 2010. Now we have the data for that, but they're asking us to use the formula or, or use this model that was, uh, that was um, created from this data. So we're going to plug in x equal to 10 into this model here. And this is really a job for a calculator. That's because 
um, it's got a lot of a lot of uh, weird numbers to work with, so it's really just a job for that. So all I'm doing is I'm plugging 10 in for x. So we have 26 times 10 squared. That's the first part, 26 times 10 squared. And then plus 804 times 10. Okay, and then plus 15, 547. And this, 26 times x uh, times 10 squared, plus 804 times 10, plus 1547, should be the same thing as this with 10 plugged in. And it looks to be that way. We get 26,187. All right. By how much does the formula underestimate or overestimate the actual cost? So this is the actual cost. We have 26,237, and this says 26,187. This number that we found with the model is lower than the actual data that was, was found um, for, for, for a real life scenario. So this number is underestimating um, this number. This formula is underestimating it. So we're gonna say it underestimates, and what does it underestimate by? Well, we're gonna take this number, We'll take 26,237 minus 26,187, that's the number we just found, and it underestimates it by $50, which considering that these numbers are so large, $50 is, is not very far off, so it's a pretty good model in, in my mind. Now we can use the formula to project the average cost for the year 2016. In other words, plug in 16, or x. So same idea, 26 times 16 squared plus 804 times 16 plus 15547. And that will give us the projected cost for 2016, $35,067. Hopefully this is all correct, and it is.